Hello. Greetings and salutations, my beautiful people, and welcome to the Calicara Show, where I always have to do the duty of deciding whether or not things deserve to be slaughtered or salvaged. And what do you know? It's nearly Valentine's Day. The best time of year to remind everybody that your life isn't worth living unless someone is fucking you. In all seriousness, though, I wanted to do something a little bit more special for this video, seeing as that it is so close to Love Day, and it just so happens that luckily, all of the incredibly kind and generous donators on my Patreon actually managed to breach an amazing milestone on my page. Just just in time for the holiday of love and appreciation. So in celebration of that, today we're going to be doing a video on a game that was voted on by all of my Patreon supporters to express my gratitude and thanks to all of you guys. Seriously, I really can't thank you enough and I really do hope that this is the video that you were hoping for. But fucking hell guys, you must really love me because you didn't pick any shockingly terrible games. Looks like some people appreciate my videos. And today we're diving into Rayman 2, one of the coolest yet most jarring sequels in video game history. Not just for the jump from 2D to 3D, but by going from this happy-go-lucky Billy bollocks to... I don't know who in the hell at Ubisoft decided to directly follow the escapades of Mr. Dark in fucking Bandland to tortured slaves on a flying pirate ship begging for water, but I think they had something strange for breakfast that morning. Talk about a total tonal shift that my younger self didn't see coming, and no joke, I was scared to play this game for the longest time after the intro alone. Then I managed to breach that fear, keep playing through until about the halfway point, and then... Yeah, this game is fucking nuts. Ah yes, I need to make this clear. All those years ago, I played the PS2 version of Rayman 2, Rayman Revolution, and I'm fully aware that Rayman 2, the great escape on PS1, is not the ideal way to play the game, but, you know, it's a game on my favourite console. Mm. My favourite thing to come out of France, I think it was the perfect match for the channel. Anyway, we begin with a rather spooky and ominous introduction instead of the ridiculous nonsense in Rayman 1. The colours are dark and brooding, the subject of this game is the world being slowly drained of everything. It's definitely the Shadow the Hedgehog of the Rayman series so far. <laughs> Look what the pirates have done to our world. Holy shit, they turned the ocean into a cube! And hey, it also sounds like Lee the Fairy, the lady talking to us right now, agrees with my assessment of Spider-Man needing to be called Spider-Man and goes off on one calling our main hero... Raymond. Although that kind of makes Rayman just sound like an office worker. While on the topic of voiceover, I must say, I don't remember Rayman Revolution being too awful in the voice acting department, but here on the mighty old ploistoition, it's some of the worst I've heard in a decent game with a serious plot. Yippee! You don't look so good, are you hurt? She likes to hang out around here. Have you seen her? The warship and the pirates are very dangerous. A new power. Oh, Rayman, calm down. Anyway, at the start, Rayman has already been captured and thrown into a cell on the pirate ship of Admiral Razorbeard, full of the starving, dying slaves. Family fun for everyone. And then we get a new cellmate in the form of one of Rayman's best friends, Glowbox, who gives us a small amount of our power back in order for us to escape. <laughs> Although I would quite like it if Glowbox stops... Glowbox, what are you... Glowbox, stop stop making that noise. You're enjoying whatever this is far too much. So we escape out of a hatch and collect every single red lum on the way down the chute because I'm a boss, and then Glowbox accidentally knocks us off the ship as we crash land in the middle of a forest. A forest? Forest! Yes, this is more like the Rayman I know. Sorry, Rayman. Everybody loves Rayman. Look, they even have the... um These things, you know, from the first game. The... the blue... Testies beast. Rayman is slightly delirious after the fall, but now he has a goal to find his best buddy Glowbox and save the world afterwards, but we can't spend all day looking for him, so how are we gonna find him? Glowbox! Glow no, don't play it again. We don't need to see that again. What the fuck was that? Glow oh look, it's Glowbox's kids. I better be quick with finding their dad. I don't want social services coming over and swallowing the children. I'll find him in a second though, kids. First, let me show you my new trick. Yeah, pretty cool, right? No? No, you're crying. Okay, no need to be rude, you little shits. I'm not saving your fucking dad now, go away. I suppose we'll put that plan on hold for the time being and rescue these guys instead. The Teensies, who are just kind of there, honestly. But they can open portals to different levels, though, so they aren't entirely useless. And then we head for a pirate hideout nearby to find Lee the Fairy in order to get some more of my powers back. But we need to be stealthy about it, so why don't we do it with, I don't know, the best sneaking music of all time? They should seriously use this in more video games. A patrolman called in a suspicious vehicle. Signs of foul play. See what you can find out. Come on, Phelps. Got it. Okay, I'm ready to go. 
and I think I should seriously start talking more about Rayman 2's soundtrack because Great Buggering Bum Fluff is one of the greatest platformer soundtracks of all time. I've been over this before in more detail in the past, but it can't be said enough. The funky rhythm sections, orchestral epicness, atmospheric murmurs, and the way the same catchy themes are hidden so subtly into every mix of each track to match with the situation and stage can't be praised enough. And it may not have as much variety or memorable bounciness as the original Rayman, but it's one of the most cinematic and kick-ass soundtracks for something as innocent and alien as Rayman. Either way, enough about that, we found Lee trapped by a machine, so we need to blow up the machine with a tiny exploding barrel puzzle, and then voila, new power-up time, baby. We can now swing from pink lums, cool shit, and we get our big quest laid out bare for us, you know, alongside finding Globox, but... We forgot all about him. We need to find four ancient masks to wake up an ancient creature with enough power to wipe out the pirates forever. Have you ever heard of Pollocus? Um, uh, what? Pollocus? Excuse me? Pollocus? Bollock face! On to the next level then. The teens are gonna open it up for us since we've collected enough yellow lums in the stages. And Jesus Christ, Raymond is totally fucking out of it. I think the Tinsies are giving him war flashbacks. On we go to the marshes towards the first mask, but we can't get over the swamp without a helping hand, so we rescue our good friend Sam the Snake, who tells us to grab his scarf to surf our way over. No sweat, I've got this. Go! Balls. We then head for the bayou because we heard the Global! was captured by pirates around there, and Razorbeard is so fucking angry and serious about stopping me from reaching the masks that he got his own subtitles wrong. Send the warship and destroy him! Warship, 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 warship. We get another pretty standard platforming fare here, but it's getting a little bit more treacherous, I suppose. Running, jumping, climbing, and carrying things isn't all you do in the game, though. You have a fist, which means you have to fight. And what better way to show off the combat than with this common pirate enemy right here? <laughs> Okay, that was pathetic. And unfortunately, that's one of the downfalls with the game. The enemies are a total joke. Don't get me wrong, they are mostly one-hit death in the original game and in other 3D platformers like off the top of my head Mario 64 with Goombas and stuff like that. But in the original Rayman, they're built into the 2D structure and made for potentially fatal encounters if you were positioned wrong. They were obstacles, as it were. And in Mario 64, there are one-hit kill enemies everywhere that serve as an annoyance if you don't take care of them and can mess up your flow. Here, though, all the pirates are treated as separate special encounters and just stand around or slowly run while repeating the same exact shooting that you can easily strafe around and you just chip off their health until they die. And it's the same for every pirate for most of the game. Even the stronger ones follow the same strategy. They never gang up on you either. They're all pushovers. How they've managed to get the population of Monaco to obey their will, I'll never understand. And right in the middle of Raymond's quest to save the world, he has to take a break here and race around for a bit in a stupid fucking forest. <laughs> Now we're heading off for Whale Bay so we can get inside the Temple of the First Mask via the underwater passageway, but we need this whale here to give us enough air to reach the end of the ruins, so we flip the switches to free her and... Okay, you know that your soundtrack is godly when that is the noise you hear every time you do something as basic as hitting a switch. And now we have a boss. Who is it that dares disturb the tranquility of this place? <laughs> wow, he seems threatening. I don't think Raymond is ready for this. I mean, he did say at the start of the game his powers were weak. <laughs> That was fucking terrible. Sorry, Rayman 2, one of the best 3D platformers of all time. Can you explain that, please? Got mask number one, and so off to number two. Next, we head off to the hills to find it, and it's here we meet an adorable new enemy forward slash gameplay mechanic, a missile on legs that chases you and that you can mount once they get exhausted. Which is ironic, being so close to Valentine's Day, because you usually mount the thing first and then they get exhausted. <laughs> You ride through the hills towards all these bombable doors, and this is pretty fun stuff, which then leads us to meeting Clark for the first time, a big strong guy who would clearly be helpful in defeating the pirates, but there's one issue with him. Must have swallowed something bad for me. To get better, I need some life potion. It's hidden in the kingdom of the dead. 
So how do you not know what you ate if you know exactly where the cure is? Also, the cure is where? The kingdom of the dead? How do you know there's a cure there? Why would you expect anyone to go there? Why did you eat the thing that you know there's a cure for? Surely that means you knew it'd be dangerous. And yes, I know he's looking for an elixir of life, not a specific cure for a specific illness, but still, whatever he ate was so bad he was going to die and needs an elixir of life from the kingdom of the dead to fix everything. Am I the only one that finds this entire situation extremely fucking strange. <laughs> anyway, as you do, Raymond needs to visit the land of the dead. Family fun for everyone. And yes, on the PS2 version in particular, the Cave of Bad Dreams was horrible for my younger self. I mean, you saw a taster of it at the start of this video. However, in the PS1 version with the cheap, shitty voice acting, we go from this Not to this. Your point is here. Raymond, grow up. I've seen scarier stuff in my toilet. Luckily, the chase down the slimy slide while the drawling jaws of the cave monster want to eat you is still very imaginative and badass on both versions of the game, so that's fine. Mike, not much else going on in this cave alongside the first major ball moving sections which are a nice change of pace and not too frustrating because the balls respawn where you were if you accidentally throw them off or they fall off the edge of the arena. So instead, I'll just talk about more of the gameplay generally. There's a reason this game has been ported 78 times and is globally adored as one of the greatest 3D platformers of all time. It's really damn fun to play. I don't think it's one of the best good lord, but it is a really fun time. It's like a slower paced Crash Bandicoot with more open spaces, more hidden areas and battles with projectiles and that's all fine, but... It's extremely rudimentary and it has no surprises up its sleeves. Yes, there are a few things hidden in corners of levels, but there's no real major exploration here to justify the wide spaces. I mean, even the original game had massive spaces in the 2D parts to justify that kind of exploration. And the levels are surprisingly linear on the PS1 version. And linearity isn't a bad thing at all, but it's never as dense or as busy as something like Crash Bandicoot and nowhere near to a 3D interpretation of the original game. The controls, I must admit, are fantastic and it certainly can be a challenge in places, but a few more things going on in the game would have been appreciated, especially since this is probably one of the easiest 3D platformers I've ever played. Someone at Ubisoft must have tried the original game again and realised, oh wait, we made a load of bullshit here, and they felt so bad about it that they tried their hardest to make the sequel as forgiving as possible because boy it shows. Not just getting through levels normally either, finding all the lums and caged creatures isn't difficult at all since you just need the most basic of path diversions in order to find them. They all get found in the same basic way, slightly off the beaten path, and everything is a little too cut and dry to be that interesting for 100% completion. Dying has no consequence at all from frequency of checkpoints and the ridiculous amount of red health lums everywhere, along with no lives to worry about or continues. And even if you lose all of your health and game over, you mostly just load up at the last checkpoint that you always do like if you just fell into some lava or something. Like, what? What's the point? But hey, back to the story. Look, we beat the fucking monster, got the life brew, gave it to the total imbecile and he nearly eats us whole. I can smell your breath from here, you weird, weird, weird man. At least he's okay now and can smash through wooden barriers that we couldn't get through before. Go on then, Clark. Go, Clark. Clark. Go, Clark. Go oh, there we go. Oh, hey, look, more missiles. And I must admit, I never remember having any trouble controlling these things on the PS2 when I was younger. And maybe I'm wrong, but I swear the controls on these things in the PS1 version are god-awful. You bounce all over the goddamn place, and turning is so bloody heavy that you can barely move around obstacles that require immediate reactions to, and barely keep on the fucking stage in the first place when you want to turn back onto the path in case you slide too far off the edge, but the momentum will just keep carrying you off anyway. Maybe this version of the game will give me something that the PS2 version doesn't a little bit later on. I mean, uh, maybe it's got something going on that I'd like. Oh! It's not here! It's not here! It's not here! Okay. Family fun for every- No! This isn't okay, Raymond. This fucking thing and the fucking music accompanying it was enough to make me never touch Rayman again for a long time. That sounded really wrong and I'm taking it back. I mean, nowadays it's not that bad at all, but to a young mind, the sheer panic induced from the score and the terrified, stilted, jittery animations of this multi-eyed freak spider climbing after you faster than the speed of light is enough to make you question if the escape was really that great to begin with. We need some more fun right now, and luckily we managed to find- no! In a prison cell right here, finally, and he's able to use his Rayman dance or slightly culturally insensitive screaming to get through plant growing segments and security gates by short circuiting them. One funny line later about Raymond disguising himself and being detected by the pyro cameras as a big nosed bush which I swear is just Ringo Starr with a beard and we then move on to the next mask trial. Bring me the body of this confounded Raymond. Yep, I don't think that's gonna work, mate. Oh god, okay, I remember hating this part in the PS2 version as well. This lava temple bit on your way to the second mask is a fucking pain. It's the 
the longest level in the game and relies on these bouncy fruit that you can only move by shooting your fist in the opposite direction you're moving on them. And I swear to god it never fucking works properly. Look, what am I doing wrong here? I know I'm going down a slope, but then why put a slope right there when I'm not able to control myself on it? I mean, there is one cool puzzle later on where you need to figure out how to get a key orb across the lava at the same time as yourself, but that's it. The rest of it is just a pain, and even though I already hate football, I'm 100% convinced that my hatred of football was enhanced by this fucking part of the game. Wait, so... Why do you hate football so much? Well, when I was younger, my father wanted to play football with me. And he kicked the ball in my face. Right, is that it? No! Football was my father's favorite sport. Then he died. He died playing it one Sunday afternoon. I've never looked at the sport the same way again. Oh goodness. I'm so sorry to hear that. Is there anything else? Yes! One day, a football found its way into our chimney and backed up smoke in the whole house. We nearly choked to death. My God. My mother, she also died. From the backed up smoke? No. She was murdered by a football. Uh... Then my sister died, my brother, my cousins. A football murder of our family! Get out of my office! Ninja henchman? Oh no, Rayman, what are we going to do? At least here we do get a new enemy, the pre-mentioned ninja pirates who are actually like mini-bosses. They're the most tricky basic enemies to beat if a little too high on the defense and very repetitive to go through multiple times, but they're still the most fun fight in the game. Second mask, perfect stuff. What now, bollock face? The rest of your quest will be even harder. Oh please! Now we head off to another pirate hideout and clear them out with the only non linear level in the game involving hidden switches, and then we get an extension to the running missiles with flying powder kegs. These bits, I must admit, are insanely fun. I remember this fondly from my childhood. Come on, I'm ready to go. No sweat. I got this. Go! Balls. The next stage is an entire chase level as you run away from a ship bombing the shit out of the stage. This is what I'm talking about. I'm actually concentrating now. I'm engaged. This is a badass stage here. It's starting to feel like the great escape that was advertised to me. You know, at least more exciting than this great escape. The following temple for the next two levels for the third mask is the hardest set of stages so far, but not necessarily nail-biting or mentally taxing. It's still a comfortable ride and we're nearing the end, and honestly the only times I found myself fucking up a jump or dying were because I was getting so carried away with the flow of Raymond with his graceful weighty controls that I was almost lulled into a permanent state of relaxation from the easier difficulty. Basically what I'm trying to say is I wasn't paying attention or I was so in the zone if that makes any sense, so that can be a little bit of an issue I suppose. Next boss, but he's not here. W where is he? There he is! Are you Rayman, the Mask Thief? Wait, Mask Thief? But don't the masks belong to Bollock Face? I'm really confused, why would the only thing that wakes Pollockus up not even belong to him in the first place? Whatever, look at the design of Rayman. Why the hot damn am I complaining about a lack of logic in this game? The boss here is actually pretty good at least, kind of tricky with the running away, avoiding the lava floor, avoiding the flame attacks, and then getting the aiming and timing right for the stalactites to fall on the thing's head. And I'm so glad the difficulty has increased by now. I mean, if you fall into the lava at any point here, you have to redo the boss all over again. It's just a shame how fucking forgiving the game is overall. It's so forgiving that it's almost pointless having a health bar in the first place. After this, we hit the Tomb of the Ancients. Ooh, and hey, the music here is is totally demonic. So demonic it made its way onto my top 10 scary tracks in video games list I did years ago, but I won't bother repeating myself when I've already done a video about it and I've spoken enough about the music here, so what about the visuals, eh? Funnily enough, there's nothing much to say as far as quirky 3D character platformers go. It's surprisingly down to earth, but I feel like it matches the atmospheric score and context of the story really well. It's not the brightest Rayman game in the world, but it's a very cool looking game. Very murky, swampy and moody, but never boring. And there's enough splashes of colour, imagination and charm throughout all of the these moodily designed places and muted colour schemes, almost acting like the ray of light piercing the darkness that was talked about at the beginning of the game. And I do love the character designs in this game. Rayman's design itself in 3D lends itself so well to the simple polygonal shapes the PS1 could accurately render, and the textures are also pretty great too. It feels like a very living and breathing PS1 world, and I dig it. And am I the only one that sees this? Whenever you try moving the camera and the game won't let you, that looks a lot like an angry mosquito to me. Am I the only one?
Okay. It also pisses me off to no end that no matter how much health you get, you can never fill up the bar to the very top. It's always a few fucking pixels off. Damn the programmers for irritating me so specifically. Speaking of irritating, here's Clark again. Unfortunately, though, he's been possessed. You trip him up with wires, you activate with switches, and keep running and jumping around to beat him. And then we bugger off and leave him to rot in the underground too. Have a nice death! Next level, and we need to save this... Things, children, by doing the single most annoying and unnatural thing on the already heavy missile runners. You somehow need to defy gravity to reach the switches, and I still to this day have no fucking clue how to do this efficiently. What am I missing here? This is just a total pain in the way that I do it, but I can't see any other way to do it. The missile doesn't run around the edges of the wood on the ship, so you kind of have to very slightly run off the edge and hope that you jump into the air and land on the next angle of the wood. I mean, who thought this was a good idea? At least I can say it was worth saving those kids by hitting the switches, because as it turns out, one of the kids just happened to stumble on one of the ancient masks of power on the floor somewhere and decided it was good enough to eat and then regurgitated it at us. Oh god, we're at the end of the game now, and it's probably the hardest part of the game, with a final gauntlet of tricky sliding, followed by a multi-axis flying section, which I thought was really cool and challenging, especially with all the spinning around you can do manually. Then we throw some bombs at Razorbeard. <laughs> it's like a razor on a beard. And then the final flight-based battle commences. And luckily, the final boss of the game is not only the hardest bit of the game, but also the best fight, and tests everything from your speed, reactions, and extremely brief puzzle solving with a particular type of missile you need to use against him, which I gotta admit, it took me a while to figure out what the game wanted me to do, I'm not embarrassed to admit that. But it ain't too bad, really. I mean, you know what they say, when the world is in danger, you must- Leave it to Ray, leave it to Ray, leave it to Ray, man. And after all of that, Raymond 2, The Great Escape, gets the salvage today. It may be far too easy for the most part, but the brilliant control, soundtrack, and memorable world you run and jump through is enough for me to see why this game is considered a classic, and I'd rather replay this one over Rayman 1 any fucking day of the week. I will be the first to admit, however, that this is not the ideal way to play Rayman 2. My money still goes to Rayman Revolution on PS2, but for everyone telling me how awful this port of Rayman 2 was, where there's like 50 ports that exist, I don't know, guys. I didn't think it was that bad at all. Have you ever played Rayman 3D? I mean, the PS1 version has its moments of bullshit, but it's not that bad at all. It's pretty good. It does have tons of cut content, though. Cut levels, cut story scenes, all sorts of stuff. And even Revolution gives you all of this within an open, connected world, bridging it all together, and even purchasable upgrades, and more enemies, secrets, tons more shit. Basically, what I'm saying is that if you want to see why Rayman 2 is so beloved and ported a million different times, just play any other version than this one. There are better versions of the game to play. So yeah, that's all I can say. If it's your birthday today while watching this video, happy freaking birthday to you. And please remember to stay beautiful. Thank you so much for watching this video on Rayman 2, I did everybody, and thank you again to all the incredible Patreon supporters, and I can only hope you enjoyed this video that you all voted for. You have helped out this channel in some of YouTube's darkest times like you can't even imagine, and I know I say that so much that it may have lost all meaning or sincerity, but I mean it every time I say that. And I'm so incredibly mind blown and thankful to you all that this was the least I could do to show my appreciation. I just really hope you guys like the video, you know who you are out there. In the future I might do another Patreon choice video, this was incredibly fun to do and it was interesting interesting to see what you guys wanted me to talk about, so there you go. Special thanks to the top tier supporters, Omar Matu, Basil, Patrick Ferguson, Andy Ellis, Robert Alamsha, I Have a Portal Gun, Gamer Man, Alicia Knightley, Super Spyro Fan 2010, Daniel Leon, Jay Knives, Carsten, Mitchell Reed, Tiago Pereira, A.D. Thornton-Smith, Oblivion Rising, Noxious, Ellen Rilpley, Kirsten V. QB, Nathan Young, and Nicole Ganara. Thank you every single one of you once again.